Джонс. Американских собак. Американских собак. Ха-ха-ха-ха. Компания товарища Трампа мудро приняла нашу помощь. You're such a good doggy for Russia. He always doing what Putin asked him. This is all people know about Russia. Is Russia interfere with election? They literally Russia communism Putin land. Americans don't know anything about Russia. Nothing. That's why we are gonna hopefully cure. Look at this. Abraham Lincoln would be ashamed. Because we're gonna talk about Mr. Lincoln Project, the real Lincoln Project to have good relations, balanced relations with the Russian Empire. Okay? So let's get this Lincoln's project garbage out of our system. So today, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to be talking about two large countries on opposite sides of a planet with almost polar opposite systems of governance and alternative histories these two destined one day to become superpowers locked in an endless cold war teamed up teamed up to fight a common enemy and to fight an injustice, the injustice of slavery. <clears throat> On the left here, you can see President Abraham Lincoln shaking hands with the Russian Tsar, Alexander II. Alexander II. As you see down here, the cartoon says, extremes meet, which feeds into what I'm talking about here. Behind Abraham Lincoln, we have the devastated uh, lands of the Americas, uh, crushed by civil war. And behind um, our friend Alex, Alex II, the Russian Tsar, we have some kind of troop marching going on. Uh, it's possible this could be an insurrection which Alexander had to put down within his own country. So let's go ahead and get started and talk about the history of Alex and Abraham. And this is uh, based on a book called Lincoln and the Russians by Albert A. Waldman. Here we go. The Civil War. What was the Civil War about? Now, most people will leap to the widely accepted answer that the Civil War was about slavery. And I would completely agree with that statement. That is an accurate statement. The Civil War was about slavery. What else was the Civil War about? In a more simplified term, the Civil War was about one section of a country trying to keep another section of a country from breaking off and forming its own country. Okay, so it was a fight to stop the United States from splitting apart in a civil war. So that's what the Civil War was about. Why they split? was primarily due to the fact that the South was a land of slavery where four million were enslaved and the North was a no slavery zone. Okay, now when you ask most people who fought the Civil War, they'll say the North and the South. And you go, who's the North? The Union. Who's the South? Confederacy. And that's the Civil War. 
But there are more ways to view what happened in the world between the years 1861 and 1865 when the Civil War was taking place. If we take our little telescope and sort of zoom out a little bit, we can see that the Civil War was not just an isolated conflict. There were a series of Republican style, so in the style of the United States, Republican style sort of civil wars going on across the Western Hemisphere. There was unrest going on in South America as much of the, I believe, Spanish and Portuguese uh, empires began to vacate South America. And those who were left were forced to decide how to divide up what the empires had created. And the Brazilians and the Paraguayans and the Bolivians, I believe the Bolivians, maybe not, maybe the Argentinians, these countries, the Uruguayans, I believe were also part of it, these countries had big disagreements over what was whose. And that devolved into a war that was actually worse than the Civil War, going on at the same time. It was called the Triple Alliance War. And it's definitely something I recommend doing a deep dive on sometime. It's really fascinating. So we have that going on in South America. In Mexico, we have a general breakdown of society here as well, a kind of uh, insurgency sort of situation, maybe like an Iraq type situation where um, it's not a civil war like an organized civil war like the North versus the South conflict in the United States. It's uh, kind of all sorts of factions are popping up around Mexico. And the Republican government in Mexico City is finding it difficult to keep Mexico from falling apart. So all of this is going on simultaneously. And all of these different conflicts had influence on each other. Some of them shared uh, soldiers that they fought in. They fought in one war and then went and fought in another. Um, they shared uh, some of the battle tactics and the technology that was available to them. They were all defining what modern warfare was going to be like uh, during this time period. So that's one way to view the Civil War. Besides the traditional, it was about the North versus the South. You could just view it as a period of general, violent, civil conflict on the whole Western Hemisphere as the dynamics of the world rapidly changed. And it was rapidly changing because empires were finally kind of getting kicked off for good. But it was also a very important conflict, not just for the Western Hemisphere. Europe, Africa, okay? These continents also had a stake in the game. Um, Africa, for obvious reasons, so much forced migration to these places had taken place. And in certain places like Haiti, those who had come from Western Africa, from different provinces and tribes of that region, found that they were in the majority in places like Haiti and actually took control of the government. Lincoln was also, as we talked about last week, thinking about sending people across to um, Africa in a colonization effort. So this was America thinking about planting some influential US-friendly country on the coast of Africa. Okay, so there's a back and forth going on here. Europe, a lot of people don't know that the Civil War almost turned into a what would have been called a world war because it involved the United States and, and England, and, or I mean, and Europe. So who was interested in what was going on in the Western Hemisphere in Europe? So obviously Spain, because Spain still had still owned things around here, still owned Cuba. Uh, Cuba was a slave, where slavery was legal in Cuba, okay? Um, 
France had seen what was going on in Mexico and saw an opportunity to potentially go over there and take control of Mexico. So France is saying, now if it was, let's say, okay, if it was 1850 and France was like, eh, you know what? I think I wanna go grab a piece of Mexico for myself. Uh, they would go over there and what would happen? Uh, President uh, Millard Fillmore would say, the Monroe Doctrine prevents you from engaging in imperialism in this section of the world. But because the United States was engaged in a civil war, they were not in a strong position to enforce the Monroe Doctrine. So France thought that they could eh, sneak on over there to Mexico, maybe plant a puppet leader friendly to their country, and, you know, sort of like gain, regain a foothold in the Western Hemisphere. Now, Britain got involved in the conflict in a unique way as well. At the beginning of the war, uh, President Lincoln blockaded the South. The South was the land of slavery, and what did the slaves produce? Primarily. They produced cash crops, cotton, stuff that you grow and you can sell, but it's a raw material. You don't just immediately consume the thing you bought. It's, it's a cash crop because you sell it and it has to be worked over in like factories and industry and by experts or whatever to get it to be the thing that you can actually sell that makes a profit for the factories. So this part of the country is supplying raw materials through slave labor, okay? And ironic, so, and as if a total coincidence that Great Britain is in the, in the throes of industrial boom. So getting that cotton and all of those cash crops from uh, the South is vitally important to uh, Britain's economic interests. Well, when the Civil War breaks out, Lincoln throws a blockade around this part of the country. And suddenly, all that lovely cotton that was coming from the States stopped coming. And a fairly conservative government uh, started to get very angry that Abraham Lincoln was holding up their precious cotton shipments and started throwing it out there that, hey, maybe the Confederacy is actually justified in what they're doing and we should support them. Maybe we should even send troops in there to stop the tyrant Lincoln from encroaching on self-determination. Now, at this particular moment in history, Europe uh, wasn't in a position to just kind of like send a heavy-handed presence at the time. But they were, they were planning it, they were thinking about it. And they were even trying to get together with France and sort of like work together towards, maybe as a coalition we could go over there and do something and break up the US power. And then we could, you know, you'll have Mexico and uh, maybe uh, New England will want to join Canada or something, who knows. Uh, so that was what they're thinking. Okay. So as pressure grows for this region here to sort of maybe take advantage of the situation that's going on in America, uh, who is there to stop France and Britain? from attacking and joining the Confederacy. Who is there? Who's gonna stand in the way? I'll tell you, it's gonna be Russia. Right back here. So let's get into it now. All right. So these are some passages from the Lincoln and the Russia, Russians book. This comes from the preface, kind of sets things up a little bit. Is Russian-American war inevitable? Must the conflicting political systems of the democratic United States and communistic Russia lead them to the battlefield? So this is from the 50s, this book, I believe. Or can they, despite their clashing ideologies, coexist in peace and work together for the salvation of the world? The little known story of Russian American relations during the Civil War may help to furnish answers to these all important questions. Abraham Lincoln, the Supreme American, who knew Russia as a country where they make no pretense of loving liberty and regarded her government as the exemplar of despotism, led our government into an informal yet firm alliance and working partnership with the realm of the Tsars, 
despite the fact that our government of the people, by the people, and for the people, and Tsar Alexander II's absolute autocracy were the very antithesis of each other. The Russian-American Entente Cordiale was a political paradox without equal. To the ruling classes of Europe, the United States was then the world's most dangerous and extremist revolutionary government. It's an interesting way to think about it. He goes into comparing them to the Reds. He's like, we were the Reds. The Americans were the commies of the day. Uh, and on the other hand, Americans regarded Russia as the classic example of absolute power and despotism and the foremost exponent of suppression of popular movements throughout the world. And there's going to be a suppression of a popular movement that's going to take place during this period when the United States and Russia are more aligned. And we'll see how they resolve that issue. It's going to take place with Poland. All right. So the last thing the Russians wanted was for the empires to come back to a broken Republican version of the, of the Western Hemisphere and where they'd have to compete with them again. Uh, so the Russians being behind, being to the east of France and Britain, thus behind them, uh, decided that they were going to join up with the United States. At least that's the version that we normally hear. And the big moment of that joining, the moment when they really showed how strong the alliance was, it was the arrival of the Russian fleet, the Russian naval fleet. In September 1863, a Russian fleet of six warships headed to the east coast of North America and stayed there for several months. Based in New York, they patrolled the surrounding area. A similar thing occurred in the west where a fleet of six warships was based in San Francisco. This helped to prevent sudden attacks of southern raiders on these crucial Union port cities. Coalition. It's crazy. Think about how far away it was. But why were the Russians so keen on helping us? Could it be that they had motives that went beyond simply being our friend. The Polish Uprising. January 1863 to 1864. Those, though, though, though some people say it went later. It went further. So take a look at this picture here, all right? We're going to go into map world a little bit again to try to explain some of what was going on. So here's where the Russian government is. I'm running my mouse over it. That's St. Petersburg. That is the capital of Russia. It was established in the 1700s. Uh, the old capital was Moscow, deep in the interior, but then they moved, they built the city uh, here and made this their capital. Why would they do that? Why would they just randomly pick up and decide, hey, let's move our capital? Well, Peter, for whom this city is named, was and a navalist. He was very interested in having a Russian Navy. So he wants to put a port here um, on this body of water, here on this Gulf, so that he can engage in commerce with Europe and also so that his Navy, which is more important to our story, can get out in the water and participate in some of the fighting and the conquering that's going on in the region and the security and all that kind of stuff. But Problem is, you can see what a small little inlet it was, right? It has to take you right out here. You got to go through this area right here. You got to go past Poland, oh, by Germany. Hopefully, you're not having you know any problems with Germany, right? <laughs> well, Russia will at some point. 
Uh, you gotta like go through this. Oh my gosh, the Germans could mine the crap out of this, right? So it's not a great place to be for a navy. Um, and during the 1860s, you saw what the ships looked like. They were not ironclads, okay? So we're not gonna be taking our navy across uh, so much from the Arctic ports that we have up in the north. We're gonna be primarily using this as our outlet. So, just as the United States had watched a portion of its country secede or attempt to secede from the whole, a portion of the empire of Russia also attempted a secession in January of 1863, and that portion was Poland. Uh, it also included Lithuania and a part of Belarus, but for our the purposes of our discussion, we're just going to refer to Poland here, okay? So, now there's this extra thing tossed into the equation. We have Poland right here uh, asking for independence. And we have Russia unwilling to grant the independence. Now, it just so happens that many Polish people living in the Russian Empire uh, did something that a lot of people across Europe did when the Civil War broke out. A lot of people who were involved in freedom fighter organizations. They left Poland. They left Germany. They left Italy. They left France. They left Ireland and England to go and participate in the Civil War for myriad of reasons. Sometimes they were ideological crusaders who wanted to be part of the struggle to end enslavement once and for all. Some of them were opportunists who wanted a chance to serve in the United States military as a way in to American life. And many of them just wanted to get some fighting experience in a top of the line military and learn some things that they could take back home with them in their struggles for independence and their struggles against, as they saw it, tyranny. In 1861, at the outbreak of the Civil War, the Poles in the United States were estimated at 30,000. The Germans, the Irish, the French, and others surpassed them in numbers. The call to arms by both the North and the South brought out hardened volunteers the majority of whom had fought in wars of liberation on the continent. The Polish-American historian so-and-so breaks down his effort to 4,000 for the North, 1,000 for the South. And so when stirrings of rebellion began taking place in Poland, the Polish-Americans who were fighting back home started to read about what was going on and started to feel sympathy for what was going on and started to pressure public American politicians to support what the Poles were trying to do. I can tell you a personal story about Poland, which is interesting. I was at James Madison's house. <laughs> I was just hanging with James. Uh, and I was literally hanging with James Madison. I was hanging with a reenactor dressed as James Madison. And I asked him, you know, looking back at this American revolution that you've gone through, um, do you look out at the rest of the world and see this experiment repeating itself somewhere? And he specifically mentioned Poland at the time. So the U.S. had its eye on Poland as this place of, like, struggle against tyranny. So people were emotionally connected to the struggle of the Polish people. But one thing that's interesting about the struggle of the Polish people is that it's kind of a pro-slavery revolt-ish. Uh, direct comparisons between Poland and the Confederacy are not going to work. The Confederacy was dominated by slave interests. Uh, and the, the things that happened during the Civil War were dominated and pushed so hard by the slave interests. Uh, but in Poland, uh, Poland had serfs. And this was around the time that Alexander II 
had released his Emancipation Manifesto, and we'll be comparing a little bit later the Russian Emancipation Manifesto to the American Emancipation Proclamation to see how they approached the issue of slavery differently. So, uh, you know, in some sense, the Ru you know the Russians came for the Poles' slaves, and it was like one of the things that pushed them too far. But I, w I wouldn't say it was the primary thing from what I read. Uh, the primary thing was that uh, Russia attempted to install a repressive pro-Russian government, and when it wasn't working, the pro-Russian president of Poland uh, tried to force Pol like all young Poles to uh, get drafted in the uh, Russian army, and that basically caused like a massive backlash, a massive riot and revolt. Uh, the Polish were not really able to organize well enough. They resorted mostly to guerrilla tactics, and they had inferior weapons to the Russians, and so uh, they did not win the fight. But it dragged on for about almost two years, and the whole time, Lincoln had to balance the good relations he needed to have with Russia to prevent, to, to have them as a check, okay, thinking chess-wise, having them as a check on France and Britain. If you lose Russia, you don't have that check there, and France and Britain are, have a little bit more free hand to potentially join the Confederacy. Uh, but at the same time, you have all these people who are Polish fighting for the Union, <clears throat> and you have all these other countries who are saying, you know, condemning Russia for its treatment of the Poles, that it's not, it doesn't look good for the United States. Um, and it's a very typical story, right? The US allying itself with some power that is less than, um, less than good, let's just say, a corrupt power or a violent power uh, for its own national interest. Um, but in this case, the national interest was like Lincoln was literally uh, trying to prevent the country from falling to pieces. So it's understandable why Lincoln would hesitate to support uh, Polish independence. <laughs> Woodrow Wilson, incidentally, be, was the one who really uh, fiercely argued for supporting Poland. I believe it was during his time in office that Poland finally became a, a, a nation. But um, it is a very conservative nation, that's for sure. So that's something else to think about. All right, blank. Now, when the Russian fleet came to the rescue, came to the United States ports to protect us, there were shouts of joy and glee, okay? There were poems written by Oliver Wendell Holmes. I'll read you a few lines. Shadowed so long by the storm cloud of danger, thou whom the prayers of an empire defend, Welcome, thrice welcome, but not as a stranger. Come to the nation that calls thee its friend. It's not my favorite poem. Let's just read the last line. Fires of the north in eternal communion. Lend your broad flashes with evening's bright star. God bless the empire that loves the great union. Strength to her people. Long life to the Tsar. Long live the king, long live the king, long live the king. This is what the U.S., the entire idea of the U.S. is not long live the king, it's get rid of the king. <laughs> uh, at least that's what the U.S. tells itself. Well, long live the Tsar. In Moscow, a new exhibition tells visitors of the deep friendship between the great reformers of the 19th century, the Russian Tsar Alexander II and US President Abraham Lincoln. An exhibition on the friendship between Russian Emperor Alexander II and US President Abraham Lincoln is on display in Moscow. The exhibition tells Russians about a brief but important period of history in the last two centuries. Diplomatic relations between Russia and the U.S. became stronger during the American Civil War. At that time, Alexander II supported Lincoln in his quest to save the American Union. For 200 years, relations between the United States and Russia 
pragmatism and friendship have been the two main features of the relations between the United States and Russia for 200 years. Pragmatism and friendship. That's a really good way to describe the relationship. Friendship in the sense that the two countries kind of put on, are, are capable of like getting along with each other on a personal level and putting on like a uh, very uh, showy sort of like tributes to each other to be like, we respect each other. It's this sort of sentimentalized version of how Russia and the United States, big country, respect each other. And pragmatism is kind of how we say to each other, like, you know, oh, we know what's good for each other. We know what's good for the world. Uh, so we could agree, you know, so we don't uh, fight with each other. Um, so that's the pragmatism and all of that. So the U.S. very strongly sided with Russia and did not come to the aid of the Poles, uh, nor was it remotely uh, even uh, feasible that they would. So there's a sense, you know, Russia and fleet comes to protect the United States. We have this friendly moment. We have these wonderful poems glorifying it. Russia, our great friend. Um, you see this cartoon here where Secretary of State uh, Seward is bringing Russia salve, which is an ointment salve, to President Lincoln. And Lincoln is pointing that it ought to go on Napoleon and John Bull. In other words, Napoleon III or France and John Bull, the representative, uh, this, the Uncle Sam of England. So he's saying to Seward, that balm, right? So not like, a, not like a bomb like we see here or a missile or a syringe, but this ointment of Russian, uh, this Russian ointment is all we need to alleviate ourselves of the problem, the affliction of Europe's intervention in our affairs, okay? So it's a soft, you know, and he's the Secretary of State, William Seward, so he's the soft power. Um, and I'm sure that this uh, cartoon is making fun a little bit of our relationship, but it's a, it's, it's a pro. I think it's pro. All right, you can even see here, Dr. Lincoln's specific, Dr. Lincoln's cure, Dr. Lincoln's specific for Confederate rash, Russia salve. There you go. All right. But there were those in the Republican Party who sniffed out that all this Russian friendship was a, a little bit more, it was, that there was a little bit more of a cynical dimension to the agreement here. Senator Charles Sumner, uh, a quote, radical Republican, Senator, anti-slavery, fierce crusader, who was chairman of the U.S. Senate Committee on Foreign Relations, once wrote in 1863, at this moment, so October 6, 1863, the Polish insurrection has already taken place and is well on its way. At this moment, I am more solicitous about France and England than about our military affairs. Foreign intervention will introduce a new vast and incalculable element. It would probably provoke a universal war. Don't forget about all the wars taking place in the other parts of the Western Hemisphere at that time too. You will observe the hobnobbing at New York with, Russian, with the Russian Admiral. Why is that fleet gathered there? My theory is that when it left the Baltic, war with France was regarded as quite possible and it was determined not to be sealed up in Kronstadt. If at New York, they could take the French expedition at Veracruz. You guys get that? Let me explain what that is. Back to the map. What he's saying is that because of the, I believe because of the worries about the Polish insurrection and France who was hawkishly sort of saying like, let's go and support the Poles, uh, Charles Sumner was saying that the reason the Russians actually sent the fleet to the United States was simply that otherwise it would be here. It would be stuck here in this crappy part of the world where it would be... He, he was saying that the Russians wanted to get the fleet out as a just-in-case measure because if France did decide to join with the Poles, they could block uh, the Russian Navy completely in here. They're completely boxed in. So they needed to get out and, and go somewhere. And they thought, why not go to New York? 
um, where we can uh, be free and we could go and we can attack uh, Veracruz, which is the port city uh, in Mexico. If the French were if the French were going to send troops to Mexico, okay. So there was potentially that whole like, oh wow, the Russian troops came to save us it was really just a ploy for the Russians to get out, get their navy out of a disadvantageous position and send a message to France. All right. Um, so, slavery. Slavery was a dimension of both of these conflicts. Um, and it's really interesting because the quote I'm about to read you comes from the vice president of the Southern Confederacy. Uh, and uh, this was Alexander Stevens. He was a... He was a... Um, he was the vice president of the Confederacy. Anyway, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, and he has this famous quote that people bring up often to show, you know, that the Civil War was about slavery. And this quote certainly shows that. But it also shows that it wasn't just about preserving slavery. Let's internationalize slavery now for a moment. Let's not think about the worker element, the human rights element. Let's just imagine a part of the world where slavery is legal and thrives. Looking around at the, as country after country around the world issues emancipation decrees and is saying to itself, our way of living, our economy is very much going out of style. And not only are we trying to preserve slavery here, but the South was trying to perpetuate slavery. The South was trying to advance slavery. The South was a bastion of a way of life that was under threat. So thinking of it that way, let's read Alexander Stevens' quote as a kind of uh, advocacy for almost like an international <laughs> of slaveholders to, you know, to advance the cause of slavery, not just to preserve slavery, as it's often said, the South fought to preserve slavery, but to advance it, okay? The new constitution, had, this is talking about the Confederate constitution. The new constitution has put at rest forever all the agitating questions relating to our peculiar institution. African slavery. This was the immediate cause of the late rupture and present revolution. The prevailing ideas entertained by Jefferson and most of the leading statesmen at the time of the old constitution were that the enslavement of the African was wrong in principle, socially, morally, and politically. Our new government is founded upon exactly the opposite ideas. Its foundations are laid. So what he was saying was Jefferson allowed slavery but was embarrassed about it. This new country is not going to even be embarrassed about it anymore. Okay, This country is going to promote it. This country is going to glorify it. So it goes even deeper than what it usually, the treatment this quote usually gets. The treatment this quote usually gets is, see, that's proof the South fought to protect slavery. When in reality, they fought to advance it, to spread it further, maybe to Mexico, definitely out west, maybe across the Pacific to some other places, Hawaii, Philippines. Last line here, this, our new government, is the first in the history of the world based on this great physical, philosophical, and moral truth that black people are not equal to white people, right? The great objects of humanity are best attained when there is a conformity to the creator's laws and decrees. All right, whatever. So serfdom in Russia 
kind of started um, in the in a very early period. I got differing answers on when that period actually was, and its legalization was uh, set down sometime around Peter the Great, um, Catherine the Great, and maybe some of you are watching a show about Catherine the Great right now. Uh, was interested in potentially reforming serfdom, uh, but she got quickly told that, you know, hey, no go. The serfs were Russians, by the way. Um, they were not imported from somewhere, although they were treated as property and they were moved around the country fairly frequently. Um, in the, so they were trafficked around the country. Um, so, whoop. But no one could seem to figure out a way to get rid of serfdom. Alexander the First, Nicholas the First. Russia has this terrible war in Crimea that they lose. So Russia is basically bankrupt at this point, and that's when Alexander the Second decides to emancipate the serfs. So with absolutely with the treasury drained of money from a war they just fought. Um, they decided they were going to go for it. They were going to pull the trigger on emancipation. Um, and the problem was is that uh, the question was sort of, okay, if we overturn their serf status, to what status do we turn them? Uh, do we make them... So we make them free and equal citizens. Okay. But do we just stop there? Do we go... And that's a really important question to ask because we often say, you know, uh, hands off a country or whatever, but we don't uh, always consider that sometimes after you've damaged something en enough times to like turn and walk away and just be like, well, I'm just going to leave that sitting in the dirt on fire. Uh, <laughs> it's not always the most admirable thing to do. So originally what Tsar Alexander wanted to do was to kind of like create a fund where after the serfs were emancipated, that they would be given land of their own paid for by the uh, Russian treasury. But the Russian treasury had been depleted by that awful war that Alexander's dad stupidly got Russia involved in. So... That already made the situation really rough for Alexander. Uh, he spent the first few years of his Tsar, Tsarstva, his Tsar, Tsar residency, uh, um, you know, trying to wrap up that awful Crimean War and pay as little reparations as he possibly could to just make nice with the with England and Turkey. Uh, but this left the Russian treasury pretty depleted at a time when it really needed money because it was going to engage in a massive social reform. We're talking uh, 20 million Russian peasants. Uh, but Alexander does it. He writes an emancipation manifesto. And right now we're going to compare those two manifestos. So first we're going to see in whose name each of these um, people would have made the declaration, right? Like, on what authority? So Lincoln, coming from a democratic, a democracy, democratic republic. Now I, therefore, Abraham Lincoln, president of the United States, by virtue of the power in me vested as commander-in-chief of the army and the navy of the United States, in time of actual armed rebellion against the authority and government of the United States, and as a fit and necessary war measure for suppressing said rebellion, do on the first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1863, and in accordance with my purpose, so to do publicly proclaimed for the full period of 100 days, from the day first above mentioned, order and designate as the states and parts of states wherein the people thereof respectively are this day in rebellion against the United States, the following to wit. To wit, to woo. So there was a whole line of sort of like uh, very official, you know, in the name of as president of the United States by virtue of the power vested in me, you know, all that kind of stuff. 
that in a time of rebellion, Abraham Lincoln was going to give 100 days to stop the rebellion or he would free the slaves. Alexander's decree did not come in a time of rebellion, at least not in Russia. By the grace of God, we run away. Alexander II, emperor and autocrat of all Russia, king of Poland, grand duke of Fidland, etc., make known to all our faithful subjects, called by divine providence and by the sacred right of inheritance to the Russian throne of our ancestors, we vowed in our hearts to respond to the mission which is entrusted to us and to surround with our effect, aff, affection and our imperial solicitude and our faithful subjects of every rank and condition from the soldier who nobly defends the country to the humble artisan who works in industry from the career official of the state to the plowman who, pill, who tills the soil. So we have, in the name of God, we, so a collective we, right? Uh, the autocrat is the voice of the people, right? In an autocracy, the autocrat is, is the embodiment of the will of the people, blessed by God by, and, and affirmed by the divine right of kings as the representative of the sacred right of inheritance to the Russian throne. We by that line, rep therefore, represent all the faithful subjects of the kingdom, from the soldier, to the humble artisan, to the career official, to the plowman. We speak for all when we say, enough is enough. Lincoln gives a whole list of places that will be accepted from the decree, places that will not fall under this decree okay so we have uh, lincoln's this full of excuses you know like well there's a rebellion and it's getting really dicey and i don't know what else to do because the south won't stop fighting me except give them 100 days but don't worry there's going to be a ton of places that will not be part of the proclamation where you can keep practicing slavery right like the fine print always read the fine print um and then Lincoln says, And by virtue of the power and for the purpose aforesaid, I do order and declare that all persons held as slaves within said designated states, so within the certain states that I've outlined and made like a million exceptions for, uh, and parts of states are and henceforward shall be free, and that the executive government of the United States, including the military and naval authorities thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of said persons. Okay, so very limited emancipation there. Here's how Alexander does it. Having invoked divine assistance, we have resolved to execute this task. On the basis of the above mentioned new arrangements, the serfs will receive in time full rights of free rural inhabitants. And that time was like about two years. So it was like two years from now, you're gonna be free. The nobles while retaining their property rights to all lands belonging to them, grant the peasants perpetual use of their household plots in return for a specified obligation. So there's your first problem. The peasants are going to have to pay the landowners for the land, for the right to own the land that they already live on as a slave. So in other words, all the landowner has to do is get the, put the serf in debt so that the serf cannot afford the land, uh, cannot afford to purchase the land freely and has to continue to work for the landlord. So uh, essentially slavery continued uh, unabated by Alexander's proclamation. Uh, though there were many revolts uh, that took place, it fired up a spirit of rebellion against slavery within Russia that would eventually lead to the 1917 revolution. So it was a beginning, but it would be a long time from here to the actual emancipation. Uh, so it was a very, and you can see, I won't go into all of it, you can see it's a very complicated system here of renumerations and compensations so that the landowner isn't put too hard out of pocket for giving up serfs. 
and this and upon this act sincerely believed to be an act of justice justice warranted by the constitution upon military necessity i invoke the considerate judgment of mankind and the gracious favor of almighty god we thus became convinced that the problem of improving the condition of serfs was a sacred inheritance bequeathed to us by our predecessors a mission which in the course of events divine providence has called upon us to fulfill so yeah this had to go on for a while but now divine providence has appointed us the specific king who will end uh, serfdom we have begun this task by expressing our confidence toward russian nobility which has proven on so many occasions its devotion to the throne and its readiness to make sacrifices for the welfare of the country they they turned out not to be super ready for this actually uh, none of that is how it went down they were very upset and not happy about these changes um so yeah there you go you can see the differences and uh alexander the liberator and lincoln the emancipator were subjects of toasts proposed at receptions in kronstadt uh so they both became known as the emancipators um both Tsar Alexander and, and Tsar Lincoln and President Lincoln uh, ended their careers the same way, uh, to put it mildly. They both experienced the same thing. They were both assassinated. Not only were they both assassinated, but they were both, in a sense, in a narrow sense, the first of their to be assassinated. Lincoln was the first president to be assassinated, that's for sure. Alexander was not the first Tsar to be assassinated, but he was the first Tsar to be assassinated by a terrorist, a common person. And this type of terrorism uh, would go on to become very prominent in Russia, and it would become a kind of source of resistance that would take place and eventually uh, lead to an insurrection, in, a near insurrection in 1905 and a revolution in 1917. The difference in these assassinations, though, is that very shortly after winning the Civil War and uh, abolishing legal slavery in the Constitution, uh, Abraham Lincoln was shot by a Southern sympathizing pro-slavery radical assassin. So someone who hated what Lincoln had done on slavery and the fact that Lincoln had illegally prevented the South from seceding in his mind uh, forced him to have to take out President Lincoln. So Lincoln died a martyr for the cause of slavery. Alexander II was assassinated much, much later in 1883, although many attempts were made throughout his Tsarstva. And the person who killed Alexander was not a conservative reactionary like John Wilkes Booth, but was a member of a radical left-wing terrorist group who believed that the Tsar's reforms were a disappointment that did not go far enough, that they were a scam, and they were. And Alexander II, Alexander II, was blown up by a terrorist bomb in St. Petersburg in March of 1883. Interestingly, only about four months later, the American president was assassinated in 1883, James A. Garfield. And when Garfield died, his wife Lucretia got a letter from Narodnaya Volya, the People's Will, which was the organization behind the assassination of Alexander II. Here's what it says. The executive committee, expressing its profoundest sympathy with the American people on account of the death of James Abram Garfield, feels it to be its duty to protest in the name of Russian revolutionaries against all such deeds of violence as that which had just taken place in America. This was the organization that had just assassinated the Russian Tsar. In a land where the citizens are free to express their ideas, 
and where the will of the people does not merely make the law but appoints the person who is to carry the law into effect in such a country political assassination is the manifestation of a despotic tendency identical with that to whose destruction in russia we have devoted ourselves so assassinating someone in america is the opposite of what it means to assassinate someone in russia because we're fighting against despotism and the american assassin is a despot despotism whatever may be the parties or whoever may be the individuals that exercise it is always blameworthy and force can be justified only when employed to resist force all right i got more on the subject but Oh, I didn't get to Leo Tolstoy! I don't have time! Oh, the Leo Tolstoy quote is so good. It's so good. Russians, 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 Russians,